You know, earlier this afternoon, Rahim mentioned beauty in his talk about Vienna. He also mentioned the darkness. And so both those themes are, have been weighing on my mind quite a bit lately. And I think there might be a lesson there about how we, as people who believe in ideas and liberty, win, or at least advance. So that's what I'd like to speak to you about this evening. It was a real pleasure, as I mentioned, to walk through uh, the hotel and see some of the Frank Lloyd Wright finishes and touches on the hotel. I happen to be a fan of his design influence, so the stone work, the dark wood. In fact, I like his style generally, but it really appeals not only to my aesthetic taste, but it also evokes something uh, both, that I would say is both uh, intellectual and emotional. And I think there's a lesson there for us about how we win going forward, or at least, as I mentioned, how we advance. So I would suggest this evening that we have not thought about or talked enough about beauty in our Austrian circles, because truth and beauty are, of course, inescapably linked. And Austrian economics is this beautiful, logical system. It's deductive. It's a way of looking at the world, just like Frank Lloyd Wright had his own way of looking at the world. So in his article on the sociology of the Austrian school, I mentioned that last evening, here's Joe Salerno's definition. He says, the essence of Austrian economics may be defined then as the structure of economic theorems that is arrived at through the process of praxeological deduction, that is, through logical deduction from the reality-based action axiom. So when you take that together in, in, in total, it is, in other words, it's an edifice. It's a body of knowledge. It's every bit as rooted in tangible reality as architecture is. But architects tend to think about beauty a lot more than economists do. So both Mises and his protege, Murray Rothbard, they wrote quite a lot about method, which is to say how we search for or how we discover truth in economic science. So they talked a lot about truth. But actually, if you take a look through the indices of their main works, Human Action, Man, Economy, and State, some of the others, both had actually precious little to say about the connection between beauty and truth or about aesthetic sensibilities generally. If you look through those index, index, indices, excuse me, uh, you won't see many references to art or architecture or beauty more generally. Now, we do know a little bit about Mises from theory and history and also from the anti-capitalistic mentality where we know he was a subjectivist when it comes to aesthetics as well. He has this great quote where he says, only stilted pedants can conceive the idea that there are absolute norms to tell what is beautiful and what is not. And of course, we all understand that beauty has a subjective element to it. Doesn't mean we should give it up. So maybe Mises and Rothbard didn't contemplate beauty too much because it was all around them in their lives. Whether we're talking about pre-war Vienna or whether we're talking about mid-century Manhattan, they were surrounded by architecture and music and literature and theater. That was the world they lived in, like goldfish swimming in the bowl. Beauty was around them. But we know that Austrian economics is fundamentally true. In fact, truth is its most important and fundamental responsibility as a science. But we can't afford to ignore its corollary as we have been. Without beauty, when economics is divorced from any higher human aspirations, it devolves from this beautiful theoretical edifice, which Salerno described, into some sort of bastard cousin, a business discipline of accounting and finance. Or even worse, it becomes nothing more than some sort of intellectual veneer for so-called public policy, which is really nothing more than a sanitized euphemism for politics. That's all public policy is. It's just a word for politics. So is, is economics bloodless? Does it have a soul? Can it serve beauty along with truth? It's a good question, I think, for all of us, because there's an opening here. Progressives abandoned beauty a long time ago. Progressives, in fact, they advance and promote ugliness as a matter of principle. That's what it is to be a progressive. They, they attack the very idea of, of truth. Now, some conservatives like to touch on the idea of beauty a, a little bit more. The Roger Scrutons, the Douglas Murrays, the Trad Catholics. And they consider beauty at least worthy of consideration while we're talking about capital gains tax cuts or whatever George Will is talking about. 
But if you look at the heritages and the Claremonts and the National Reviews, they're too busy defining themselves as just not progressive to talk about something like beauty. But frankly, even the best conservatives, our paleo friends like Paul Gottfried at Chronicles are exempt from this conversation, by the way. But even the best conservatives, they tend to be mired, just absolutely bogged down in faulty economics, a faulty worldview, and, and worst of all, these delusions of statecraft that they're gonna somehow capture the federal government and turn it to conservative purposes. So they really don't have truth, even when they do think about beauty. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with Steve Saylor, uh, writes for Taki Mag, and he's a great sociologist in his own right. He recently published a collection of photographs of US city hall buildings that were constructed before and after 1945, which he identifies as a dividing year in architecture. And he says that before then, before 1945, Westerners tried in many different styles to make buildings look beautiful. But after 1945, they felt like they no longer deserved beautiful buildings. And of course, when we look at older city halls, especially those from the 1800s, for example, in places like Philadelphia, we see that they invoked European classical and neoclassical architecture. But if you fast forward and look at city halls built in the 1960s and 70s, Whew, they, they tend to be these just brutalist monstrosities of concrete and glass, gray, brick, and, and we have to assume that they're deliberately made ugly on purpose. In other words, they're designed by the architect to dehumanize the viewer of the building, and God forbid you're an, you're an occupant of the building. So why in the world are economists not noticing this? I mean, architects... Austrians understand fiat money, of course. We talk quite a bit about that. But what about fiat architecture, fiat food, fiat art, fiat fashion, fiat pop culture, fiat everything? Economics isn't somehow separate and apart and distinct from the cultural ramifications of our disastrous economic policies. So maybe we should be talking about that a little bit more. Because I'm telling you folks, this hunger for beauty that we have in the West today, it's real. It's real. We're starved for it. Now, I'm sure a lot of you watched the events surrounding Queen Elizabeth's death and funeral a week or so ago. And there was certainly plenty of pomp and circumstances, uh, lots of marching. Uh, one thing the old empire still does well, they put on a show. But when I, when I was watching the marching, especially the SAS guard, I was thinking they could use a little bit of that precision over at the NHS, where you're waiting 18 months uh, to get your cancer treatment or whatever it might be. But aside from that, what pulled us all into the Queen's death and funeral, I mean, we're neutral in this, we're Americans, what pulled us into it was the spectacle. And here we see in 2022, a spectacle of reverence, reverence, even veneration, for tradition, for country, for a figurehead, for a beloved matriarch, for a hereditary monarch. So as we're watching on TV, we see these beautiful buildings throughout London. We see robed clergy conducting religious ceremonies in these majestic cathedrals. We don't see that sort of thing on TV too much in the West. Although I, I must say as an aside, they, during her funeral, they made sure to bring in plenty of these sort of vaguely non-denominational woke clergy from all over London. But apart from that, and a dreadful cameo by Liz Truss, God. But we saw all this military dress. We saw soldiers. We saw masculinity. We saw appeals to continuity. Everything progressives hate was encapsulated in those hours and hours of BBC coverage. And yet, we all know that it was somehow hollow. It all felt more like an end, didn't it, than a beginning? It felt like an end to an old world. Nobody's excited about the prospects of King Charles III, who is, of course, himself just a crazy, woke environmentalist who actually literally praised the Great Reset at a talk he gave at the World Economic Forum, of which he's a member. And his sons appear to be cut from the same cloth. 
And because of 24-hour tabloid media, because of social media, we tend to know all about their personal foibles. And we see them in a very different light than we see the departed Elizabeth. We, we, tend, we understand that these are unserious people following her up in the British monarchy. So it all felt like beauty without truth or substance. It felt like some sort of empty pageant or a museum. And of course, it was made worse by the clownish Biden stumbling around and having his giant armored motorcade that only the US leader was allowed to bring. But even despite all that, even despite the attempts by the BBC commentators to bring in all kinds of left-wing issues into the proceedings, there was something there. And, and it certainly got us all caught up over here. So imagine how the, the Brits feel. There was a hunger for some kind of seriousness and substance and meaning. The British monarch just isn't the answer. But here's the good news. And it relates to beauty in a sense. The good news is that there's at no point in modern Western history have elites ever been less impressive and more vulnerable than they are today. These are deeply unserious people, deeply unserious. And you know who I mean, you know, the Blairs and the Borises, the Klaus Schwabs, the Zuckerbergs and the Bezoses, the Pelosi's, the squads, the Bidens, the Bushes, the Clintons, all the sociology professors and the pop stars and these ludicrous influencers and the Twitter pundits, all deeply unserious people. Our elites don't care about truth and beauty. As a matter of fact, they, they work actively against both of them. But we can replace them. We don't need them. Every society has elites. The question is always whether they are natural or imposed, whether they earned their wealth and position in society or captured it through the political process. But we have to expect this. Rule by elites, at least to an extent, is indeed inevitable. Every society across time, across place manifests this. And democracy doesn't change a thing. It just transfers status away from merit and towards politics. We still have elites in a so-called democracy. So I would suggest tonight, when we're thinking about economics and our, our mission, our job, is that political and economic liberty is really about the freedom and prosperity average people enjoy in any society. That should be our focus. So if you look at the poorest and most corrupt countries on earth, they have these terrible elites who fatten their own Swiss bank accounts while parasitically draining the citizens of even their most meager resources. But in the wealthiest and least corrupt countries, Elites act far more benevolently. And I would suggest we take a look at Prince Hans Adam II in Liechtenstein as a benevolent elite. So most countries in the West today lie somewhere in the middle of these two extremes. So how do we identify good elites, wise leaders who will act and guide the world in benevolent ways and move us towards truth and beauty, leaders who care about civilization and property and prosperity and peace and justice and fairness and conservation and charity. Well, I think we have to start right here in this room. We start in small concentric circles. We start by turning our backs on politics and media and academia and popular culture and looking to the real world around us. Just look around in this room, in our family, in our work, in our social circles, in our local communities are the men and women who can replace our very unnatural elites. Men and women who understand inequality and human differences as the inseparable starting point of any decent human society. Here's what Mises said. He said, collaboration of the more talented, more able, and more industrious with the less talented, less able, and less industrious results in benefits for both. We can try to pretend this isn't real. But that's what we're doing right now. So progressives of, of, of all political stripes, left and right,
They oppose the idea of natural elites, not because of their claimed egalitarianism or democratic principles or dislike of hierarchies. No, they oppose the idea because it contemplates a hierarchy not established by them, a hierarchy where they're not at the top. And the other thing that a natural elite means is that intelligence, ability, attractiveness, charisma, wisdom, discretion, quiet confidence, all these things which are so very unequally distributed in nature, these become the characteristics of those holding greater influence in society. We can't escape this. We actually have a responsibility to be the adults in the room, if we can use that shop-worn phrase. We need to desanctify this current crop of elites and replace them with much better and nobler people. And it's really up to us. N none of this is easy. They're not going to do it for us. People don't tend to give up power and influence without a little bit of a fight. So it's not easy, and it comes with a heavy price, a personal price, actually, to be paid by all of us. Most of us in this room, by our very natures, we want to focus on our families, our personal lives, our businesses, our professional lives. We're not wired to be agitators and troublemakers. We don't necessarily see ourselves as leaders. We certainly don't see ourselves as radicals or revolutionaries, and we don't want to lead political lives. A big part of what the Mises Institute is all about is promoting the idea of organizing society around something other than politics. So I get it. I get it. But a gentleman named Richard Hanania, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, he did some research and published an article titled, Why is Everything Liberal? By which he meant, how did progressives come to control all of our institutions and end up as the elites? And in his view, it all comes down to cardinal preferences. Not ordinal, cardinal. The left just cares more. The left just wants it more. They're far more willing to engage politically. They're more willing to agitate, to donate, to choose college majors and jobs in academia or media or NGOs or HR departments for influence instead of money. And meanwhile, the conservative, hardworking people are focused on their business, and they're sending their kids off to spend eight hours a day with these woke monsters. So in this sense, our natural modesty, our live and let live attitude, our inclination to tend to our own and mind our own business, it doesn't do us any favors. So in 2003, Lou Rockwell gave a talk at the Mises Institute, and I bet some of you were there. It was titled, The Path to Victory. So in this talk, he argues against quietism, against retreat, against this to hell with it all accelerationalism, against attempting to capture lost institutions like academia and Congress and mainstream media. So he argued instead for robust adherence to truth, to education, to using every available platform, and of course, Available platforms were very different in 2003 versus 2023 almost. But also to recognize that influence can be indirect and far off in the future. Success, he said, can take many forms and changes can happen very suddenly. And that's true if we look at even American political history. Barry Goldwater was trounced, but a lot of people think that he led to Ronald Reagan. A lot of people think Pat Buchanan and Ross Perot led to Ron Paul. So you just never know where the seeds you're planting are going to sprout and when. But if success can take many forms, we have to understand that our personal happiness, our self-actualization, that's not the focus here anymore, folks. It's too late. Mises tells us that action is, it isn't, it's not ease or contentment. As a matter of fact, action happens because of what Mises calls felt uneasiness. It's our uneasiness with our lives and with the world that makes us act. He's got this great quote that I can't resist from human action. Sometimes Mises surprises you. And I'm going to apologize to any Buddhists in the room. Quoting Mises, some philosophies advise men to seek as the ultimate end of conduct the complete renunciation of any action. 
They look upon life as an absolute evil, full of pain, suffering, and anguish, and apodictically deny that any purposeful human action, effort can render, render it tolerable. Happiness can only be attained by complete extinction of consciousness, volition, and life. The only way toward bliss and salvation is to become perfectly passive, indifferent, and inert like plants. Such is the essence of the teachings of various Indian philosophies, especially of Buddhism and of Schopenhauer. I thought that was funny. Poor Schopenhauer. But he says, the subject matter of praxeology is human action. It deals with acting man, not with man transformed into a plant and reduced to a merely vegetative existence. And ladies and gentlemen, that was about half the country during COVID. And I don't think that was by accident. And I think a lot of people liked it. And these companies are having a hard time getting people to come back in the office. So I'm not sure we can save those people. But I do know that we can save ourselves and that we can form our own institutions, our own elites that are focused on truth and beauty. And I know that we have to. So before we take a quick break to give out some awards, I want to wrap up with an admonition from Mises' life. There is this hubris amongst us in the modern world. There's this conceit of imagining that we live in the most dangerous or troubled times, these times of intense and unprecedented rapid change compared to our grandparents or someone who led these slower bucolic lives. Relatively speaking, folks, I'm not so sure we do. If we consider just the lifetime of Ludwig von Mises, born in the 1880s, who died almost 49 years ago exactly, I, I believe on October 10th, almost 50 years ago, in October 1973, and in this roundabout, remarkable way, he's the reason we're all in this room tonight. A man born in the 1880s. But in his time, he came from a, a village in what is now Ukraine. He lived and worked in pre-war Vienna, which has to be one of the most beautiful places and times in the whole history of the West. I said he was surrounded by beauty. He literally was. But he also saw tremendous ugliness. He saw Vienna, his cherished Vienna, fall to the barbarism of Weimar and hyperinflation. He saw two incredibly destructive world wars ravage Europe. He saw the fall and the collapse of the Habsburg Empire. He saw Leninism and Stalinism, Nazism and Italian fascism. He saw Wilsonianism and FDR's New Deal. He saw the development of nuclear weapons. He personally had to flee war twice. And then in his chosen profession, he saw socialism and Keynesianism take it over and capture academic economics and call itself scientific. Think what that must have meant to him. And when I talk about change, folks, get, here's what he saw along the way. He saw the world go from outdoor plumbing and kerosene lamps to widespread electricity. He saw telegrams and radio and television and facsimile machines. He saw the world go from horse and buggies to automobiles, from the earliest propeller planes to jets to space travel and satellites by the time he died in the 70s. He saw communications go from telegrams to radio to television to the earliest internet in the 1960s. He lived through enough changes for 10 lifetimes. So when you think about it that way, I'm not so sure we can claim to live in more perilous times than Mises did. So we should have some of his fortitude, what he called elan vital, the French term for vital force, your life force. So we win by serving truth, of course, and we've always done that, but also beauty, which we have neglected. We win by putting economics back squarely at the vital center of understanding of all human social cooperation, not this bloodless statistical exercise. We win with a focus on the long term and not the short run. And that means beyond our lifetimes. We win by building better elites and better institutions and replacing these sociopathic clowns who plague us. And we win 
by going out unapologetically and forcefully into the world with our ideas, unapologetically and forcefully. Those SAS soldiers who were on display during the Queen's funeral, they have a motto, who dares wins. The future, folks, belongs to confident people. Let that be us. Thank you very much.